Hi guys, today I'd like to share with you on a topic that I feel pretty strongly about, especially given today's climate and context where information is so freely available over the internet, the traditional media and the new media. We get trending news and information, like it or not, being fed to us from time to time. It does not matter whether we are highly educated professionals or the laypersons on the street. There are some simple steps that we all can take to help us tease the information apart and examine them closely before we decide whether or not we want to believe in them. So truth is really all that we seek. But how do we know a piece of information is true? In my following sharing, I will be using some healthcare related examples but really the same principles can be applied well beyond healthcare into anything else that you may come across. In this slide, you see three st uh, statements carrying different information or rather the same piece of information but using different sets of tones for the respective readers. They instill very different sentiments and bring about either positive or negative emotions in people. The remarkable thing over here is that all these three statements are correct. But how can that be so? Especially statements 2 and 3 seem to be directly contradicting each other. Let's examine them more carefully later. So similarly, when we're dealing with healthcare related information, I cannot stress enough for the preciseness and accuracy of the, of the information we rely on are of significant importance. For healthcare professionals, we learn, adapt and apply reliable evidence to treat our patients. Can you imagine your doctors or pharmacists giving you bogus healthcare advices that have no scientific basis at all? And similarly, as healthcare consumers, the information you receive will impact how you manage your own health and perhaps also the people around you. I'm sure you don't want to cause harm by giving unreliable health tips to your loved ones that may run counter to your original intention of doing good to them, right? In healthcare, there is a very important principle of first do no harm. It means that we should not act on a piece of in, in healthcare, there is a very important principle to first do no harm. It means that we should not act on a piece of information if we cannot be, or be certain of its authenticity or accuracy. In a short while, I'll be sharing with you how to critically assess this information before you decide whether to believe in them or not. Secondly, patients are often at the center, at the heart of all we do. This is the motto of Sing Health where I previously worked in. And rightly so, before we do anything to or with our patients, we need to make sure that we always act in their best interest. And finally, science is all about observations and science is all about evidence. A basic prin principle of good evidence is its reproducibility. We know that an observation is likely true when we can reproduce and repeatedly observe them under the same preconditions. Here are some examples. Singapore's per capita GDP increases as its cancer rates increase. What can people say about this? Maybe economic performance causes cancer. This example may be a little extreme, but both observations are real. Both can be increasing, but for, di but for various different reasons. So we should not too casually link two unrelated observations together and draw conclusions about them. The second example is pretty famous in the US. It's very, very cold out there when environmentalists lobby against global warming. A senator even brought in a snowball to the Senate chamber to say global warming is a hoax. But an alternative explanation which is more widely accepted by the scientific community is that climate change is worsening the extreme weather patterns around the world. In the third example, we see the number of police officers increase as the number of crimes increase. Is it right for us to then say police officers causes crime? Well, it is not entirely impossible, but the reverse may be more plausible, right? And here is another point. When we are dealing with increases, be mindful of whether it is an absolute increase or relative increase. And what do I mean by that? Let's look at this table. Between then and now, there is indeed an increase in number of crimes and police officers. However, we need to be mindful that something else is also happening in the background, which is population increase. 
both increases in the crime and police officers may be more directly related to the population increase. The police officers increase may be a result of increases in criminal cases. But beyond this, however, if we take the town's population into consideration, we see that the ratio of both police officers and criminal cases actually drop if we take into the, the if we take the ratio uh, and the absolute number in relation to the population changes. So revisiting the earlier three statements, they are all true, aren't they? So really, uh, so it really depends on where you get your daily information from and what these media outlets want you to believe in. It's all the more important for you to discern what is right and make sense of it yourself. The message here is not to draw conclusions too quickly. Similarly, in the healthcare related information, we often get uh, conflicting information, conclusions and recommendation. One example is whether consuming more eggs are good for our health. In, our, in some places, uh, you see this, that overconsumption of eggs bring about a whole host of health-related issues and risks for diseases. But on another side, it says eggs are good and that the statement comes from the Ministry of Health in New Zealand and so what do we do now? What do we believe in? If we have access to the literature and the articles detailing the experiments and the studies, we can use a very simple equation to help us dissect the information. Here, I want to introduce this equation um, that looks something like this. Truth equals to observed minus errors. We know truth cannot always be what we see or observe. There are always errors, regardless of whether it is in experiments or when we observe progress of patients' population over time to find out how certain exposures are related to the outcomes we are interested in. The devils are in the errors. How much error we can identify will help us understand how much we can believe in what we observe, see, or read. So in errors, there are broadly two types, the systematic error and the random errors. Random errors is something that we that is always there that we cannot really explain why and sometimes we just conveniently say that they occur by chance. So as long as this chance for erroneous observation is present, what we observe can never be 100% truth that we hope to get. Putting that aside, let's look at systematic error, which scientists and researchers have control over. In systematic error, we can further subdivide into bias and confounding. To put it simply, biases are factors and conditions in the experiments and studies that can sway the results positively or negatively away from the truth. For example, in selection bias, we ought to look at who and how these people have been selected and enrolled into the clinical trials. Coming back to the egg question, if a study that says um, that they did an experiment comparing people who eat many eggs a day versus those who don't, and they find both groups of people have similar risks in developing heart disease. However, if we dive a little bit deeper, we may find that, for example, in selecting the people going into the group that does not eat eggs, the researchers and road subjects who were mostly unhealthy or were already sick to begin with, then we know that the comparison wasn't fair to begin with. Besides dealing with bias surrounding selection of comparators, we also need to be mindful of bias in information collection, how the data is collected, how the data is analysed, what are the instruments used, whether they are of sound quality. Is there any chance for fraudulent data collection and risking the reliability of the results? So these are the questions. And so in, in essence, for study biases, we ought to look at selection of comparators as well as method of data collection and analysis. Then in confounders, we go back to the principle earlier about making connections and associations between what we see and what we conclude. We need to be mindful of other things that may also be happening in the background that could have led to the same outcomes of interest. For instance, apart from eating eggs, do the subjects in both groups differ in other important exposures such as exercise habits, smoking, alcohol consumptions? These are all important because we already know that these factors are significant predictors of cardiovascular outcomes we are interested in over here. So if the two comparator groups are different in these baseline characteristics, 
then we cannot be certain that any outcomes we observe at the end of the day can be attributed to the consumption of eggs itself. So at the end of the day, I hope you can agree with me that apart from going for information sources that are reliable in addressing, in assessing the quality of the information that we receive, we should also cross-refer to other sources and compare them if possible. Do not accept what is directly thrown at you blindly as truth and always question the scientific basis of the claims. Sometimes it may also be useful for us to keep asking ourselves if I'm the researcher doing the experiment on this particular question, how may I do it differently to ensure fairness in comparison? I hope you find my sharing today useful. I will see you in the next video.